our culture as well as other cultures, this is a tremendously important uh, advancement that relieves a lot of suffering. Next year, 2018, we're celebrating exactly 40 years to the birth of Louise Brown, the first IVF baby. And so this technology has been around for a while now. In 2010, a Nobel Prize uh, was given for the, uh, Dr. Edwards, who uh, discovered IVF. And at that time, it was estimated that 5 million children born of IVF are currently in the world. We're now seven years later, so this number must be much bigger. Um, so IVF is a tremendous thing. It's a wonderful thing for women, for families, for our society. Um, but there was an interesting side effect to IVF. It took the uh, female egg out of the female body. For the first time in human history, it deconstructed motherhood in a way that never existed before. So all of a sudden we have a genetic mother and a gestational mother, the mother who passes on her genes through the egg and the mother who carries the pregnancy. They can be, of course, the same woman, and that's what IVF was about in the beginning, but we then discovered that it doesn't have to be the same woman. And that opened the door for a variety of things, such as egg donation and other practices. Um, the second good thing that happened to women that I want to highlight is equality. Uh, the challenges that we face today as young-ish women <laughs> are not the challenges of our grandmothers. Uh, we have attained a much higher degree of equality, of access to education, higher education, better jobs, senior positions. The problems that we discuss today is uh, whether to lean in or lean out, whether we can have it all or not have it all, what prices we're paying for this uh, equality that we now have. And of course, we don't have all of it, but we've made tremendous progress in 40 years. Uh, so in both these terms, uh, treatment of infertility and uh, women's equality, we're talking a lot about autonomy. We're talking about women having more reproductive autonomy, more control over their fertility through reproductive technology and contraception and access to legal and safe abortion. And we're talking about personal autonomy. Women can make more choices about their education, their careers, their jobs, and how to balance work and life, and uh, work and family. Um, so there's this rhetoric of autonomy. Everything, all the progress that we've made promoted women's autonomy. So we should be happy and grateful that we live in the age of women's autonomy. But here's where things get messy and complicated. The place where this progress and equality meet reproduction, it puts women in a tough spot. Because the greater equality that we have in education and in the workplace caused us, as a society, to delay motherhood. So we're talking about a phenomenon called advanced maternal age or delayed motherhood. Uh, the group of mothers that's growing the fastest today is first-time mothers in their 40s. The Average, uh, average age of a woman having her first baby has moved tremendously in all Western societies. But our bodies are not obeying. We want to wait because of the social circumstances, but our eggs are beginning to deteriorate very fast. And this is where we come to expectations. And I want to put a controversial claim on the table and explain why I invited <coughs> these four uh, magnificent women the claim is that we're taking a social phenomenon, that of women's equality and opportunities, and that of reproductive technologies as socially acceptable. And by combining these two, we're taking a social issue and dumping it on the shoulders of individual women. So the problem is structural, the problem is societal. Women are pushed to delay motherhood until an age where they have more difficulty with their fertility, but then society tells them, your problem, go get IVF, go get uh, donated eggs, or be smart and freeze your own eggs when you're in your 20s. But all these things cost women. They cost them money, they cost them health risks, they cost them psychological burdens. They're not easy solutions. So the problem around which I would like all of us to dance tonight 
is this issue of taking a societal phenomenon and making it into women's individual problem. And we have a variety of perspectives on this issue tonight. We have two uh, leading researchers in the area of egg donation and egg freezing uh, that bring ethics and sociology and uh, law into uh, this issue. And we have uh, two journalists, producers, lawyer, uh, who will share lived experience as users of the technology and the experience of producing a documentary uh, on this topic. I don't want to spend a lot of time introducing them because I believe people do a great job introducing themselves, but I'll just uh, describe the structure of the evening. We're going to hear from Katie, uh, who is from McGill University with a background from England. Let's see, I'm going to keep it really high level. <laughs> We're going to hear from Angel, who's uh, from Dalhousie University, currently working uh, with the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society. We actually have a project writing guidelines on advanced maternal age for this clinical society. And we're going to hear from Lori, who produced, uh, co-produced, produced the documentary uh, on infertility with an emphasis on egg freezing. Uh, so we'll start with Katie. All right, so I'm going to be talking tonight about um, research that I conducted while I was doing my PhD. Um, and so that was with egg donors, it was with fertility specialists, and it was also with intending parents in Canada. Um, and what I'm going to focus on tonight is the idea of reproductive bargaining and how that takes place um, for women who are choosing to donate their eggs. But just to start off, um, to give a little bit of an introduction since I'm the first person on the panel. Um, so what is infertility? So the World Health Organization describes it as the inability of a sexually active non-contracepting couple to achieve pregnancy in one year. Um, and it affects 15% or more of reproductive age couples worldwide. And though we think of infertility as often being something that affects women more than men, um, actually, um, usually it's about 30% male factor infertility, 30% female factor infertility, and 20% both partners, and then we have 20% of cases where it's unknown. So what is egg donation? So I think the other panelists are going to talk a little bit more about egg freezing and the specifics of that, but just to give you an idea of the technology and the process. Um, so the way that it occurs is that fertility drugs are used um, to synchronize a woman's menstrual cycle with the recipient, um, although when there's egg freezing, you're not, you, there's no need to do this with a recipient. Um, and basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to stimulate your ovaries to produce multiple eggs. Um, so then eggs are extracted um, and they can be fertilized using IVF or they can be frozen for later use. So usually the process takes about 10 to 26 days um, and then afterwards it's about three or five days until there's an embryo transfer. So to give you an idea of kind of the risks that are involved, um, so for a donor there can be allergic reactions to ovarian hyperstimulation. Um, there's OHSS, so this happens in about 1 to 10 percent of cases and the symptoms of this can be quite severe, um, nausea, bloating, bleeding and infection, and possible risks to future fertility. Um, and there's also psychological risks, so depression and regret. Um, in terms of the long-term risks, at this moment we actually don't really have a lot of long-term data or really any long-term data, so I can't really speak to that. Um, for intending mother, so this is the, the recipient of the egg, um, there's no significant risks relating to the embryo transfer, but there are physical and psychological risks if more than one embryo is transferred, and of course there's psychological risks associated with the process, so for instance the emotional roller coaster of um, many repeated and sometimes unsuccessful cycles, and then the financial stress that's involved. So to give you an idea of the regulative sphere in Canada, um, egg donation is currently regulated under the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, which came into place in 2004. Um, and so I just highlighted here two principles of the act. So the first is to prevent commercialization of the human reproductive ca capacity. And the second is to protect the interests of those who are most affected. Um, and so one thing that's important to point out um, and will become more relevant as I speak a little bit more about my participants is that um, in Canada, gamete donors cannot be paid. Um, so they can be remunerated for their expenses, but not above this. Unfortunately, the regulations um, that were supposed to set out what those expenses were have not yet been drafted, so it's a little bit of a murky area right now. Um, but the fines are quite big, so it can be punishable under Section 60 of the Act, and so you can be 
be punished by fine or up to 10 years in prison. So to give you an idea of my research, so generally what I was looking at when I conducted this research were um, questions around the ethical concerns in what I term egg transactions. The second was what is the role of the Canadian law in these egg transactions. And then the third I was looking at a variety of different semantic questions. So for instance, what is the value and meaning of an egg? Um, when an egg donor is paid, what exactly is this payment for? Is it for the egg itself or is it for everything that's involved with egg donation? And the third part was how do egg donors and intended parents earmark money that is exchanged? So what do they qualify that money as being for and what do they consider it as? What I'm actually going to focus on today, though, is the question of what is egg donation worth? So is it worth it? So one of my participants, Carla, said, then after finding out about the procedure, going home, talking to my husband, then it was more than just money. It was the safety issues and stuff like that. You go through all the pros and cons. Is it worth it? Um, so looking through the existing research on egg donation, it becomes kind of obvious that there has been a failure in a lot of the accounts of egg donation to take into account egg donors' capacity to evaluate the risks and the pros of going through egg donation and of donating their eggs. Um, and some opponents to compensation, for instance, suggest that um, egg donors shouldn't be able to be paid because um, compensation basically makes them incapable of evaluating what the pros and the cons might be. So I'm going to go through um, my methodology a little bit and then talk about what the pros and the cons were of egg donation as my participants saw it. Um, so for my research, I conducted 55 semi-structured interviews with egg donors who I had um, met online. Um, this is a big way that a lot of egg donors and intended parents connect in Canada, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, so this is based on the data of 15 different egg donors um, who I spoke with, um, some of them once and some of them a couple times if it was before and after a donation, for instance. And so there were 14 Canadians and one American. Um, they were all in their mid to late 20s, so nine were married or in long-term partnerships, five had children, and their occupations ranged from a number of them were students to, for instance, being a university administrator or a legal assistant um, or a first aid instructor. <coughs> so they were from five different provinces and territories, um, but the majority of them lived in Ontario. And six had acted within the law. So what I mean by this is that um, six of them had not been paid and they had done their donation in Canada. Eight had participated in the gray market. So by this I mean that they had met the intending parents that they worked with online um, and they had, they had kind of passed money under the table. And then two of them had traveled abroad to the US where you can legally be paid. And so the average number of donations were about one to two times. Um, I did have one donor who had donated 16 times. Um, and so that's quite a bit more than most of the others. So in terms of evaluating the worth of egg donation, there were four major things that egg donors kind of perceived to be the losses of the transaction. So the first was the egg donation process itself. So the length of the process meant process, the commitment involved, and clinic care. Um, so for a lot of people, this was, for instance, that the process took longer than they had expected, um, or that they felt that they hadn't been treated well by the doctor. So for instance, they were passed around to numerous nurses and doctors. They didn't see the same one over and over again. Or a big part of this was that they didn't feel as though they were a patient themselves. They felt as though they were there to serve the needs of the intended parent. Um, the second were the physical side effects. So these are just the everyday um, side effects that were involved with the process. So for instance, bloating from taking the fertility drugs, um, feeling nauseous, the little things, and then also the long-term risks. Um, so what this might mean for them in the future. The third were the emotional risks. So by this, I mean the connection, for instance, of considering that you have donated your genetic material and if a child is born, um, there is potential for an emotional risk there. And the last were financial losses. So for instance, egg donors who spent their own money in order to donate or for instance, lost their own out of pocket expenses even when they had anticipated gaining money. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the key um, themes that came up among those four losses. 
Um, so talking about the egg donation process itself, um, one donor, Tiffany, and this was the donor who had donated 16 times. Um, she says, it was two weeks of commuting back and forth. I would sometimes leave um, 4.30 in the morning to get there for cycle monitoring for the ultrasound, the blood work, and then be back at work at 9. Sometimes I would have to do that, like sometimes that last week, I'm doing that three or four times a week. So that was hard. That was really hard, but that's what I did. And so something that came up a lot among the egg donors was that the process took a lot longer than they had anticipated and involved a lot more than they had anticipated. So sometimes, even though I said at the beginning that it's up to 26 days, some donors, for instance, felt that by the time they had recovered from taking the hormone stimulation, it had felt like the process had been three months. Or if you include the process of going through the screening before you can donate, this felt as though the process had been quite long. So speaking about the physical side effects and the long-term risks, in terms of the everyday side effects, um, Adrian's quote that says it was uncomfortable but manageable, I think very much sums up a common theme that was among all of the donors who I spoke with. So there was a feeling, for instance, of getting past the psychological hurdle of having to give themselves the hormone injections. But once they got past that, it didn't feel like such a big deal. Um, one of the more prevalent aspects that came up in talking about the long-term risks is the idea about the unknowns. So Catherine says, basically the answer is that there are no long-term studies for people who have normal fertility that have been exposed to fertility drugs, right? So it's an unknown. I certainly don't have any known genetic predispositions to uterine or ovarian cancers, but that doesn't mean that I'm not increasing my risk. So yeah, I don't really know that going in and it certainly is a risk that I'm taking. So this idea of not knowing what might be involved was part of what made this a more scary aspect. And perhaps if the risks were something that we knew a little bit more about, that might not have made it such a scary thing. So the third aspect, and this was a really important one for a lot of the donors, was the idea of the emotional risks. So Brooke said, so now, this is totally honest, obviously. When I first went into this, I said to myself, I hope I can do this. I hope I can make eggs, but I hope the girl doesn't get pregnant. It was a really crazy, selfish thing to say, but I was afraid. I was afraid that this girl was going to get pregnant, and I would constantly think about having this random child out there, who's basically my child, and I wouldn't know anything about it. So again, there is kind of what Brooke is showing here is a bit of a symbolism of this genetic connection. And a lot of the egg donors who I spoke with really emphasized the fact that they were not mothers. They were not the person who was gestating the child. They didn't want the child. Um, and they didn't envision themselves in that role. But there was something symbolic about the genetic component to this. So turning now to what they perceive to be the gains of the transaction, there were four major gains. So the first was compensation and travel. So the ability to travel by, for instance, going to meet the intended parents in another province. And so uh, legitimately having the intended parents pay for those travel expenses or travel in terms of um, making money from donation and then having the ability to travel with that money. The second was egg donors' ability to pass on their genes through donation. So a number of the donors knew that they didn't want to have kids of their own, but they did feel this sense, um, one, one woman called it this kind of Darwinian need, um, to pass on their genes and feel as though they had participated in that kind of life cycle. And so for them, this was a way to do it without actually having children of their own. The third was helping gratitude and knowing the outcome of the donation, so knowing, for instance, that they, the intended parents had successfully had a child. And the fourth was just developing a relationship with the intended parents. So often these are people who, when they connect, they form a friendship. And so that can be a nice thing that, that happens as a result of this. So in terms of compensation and travel, Marissa said, I think it's the fact of the matter is that if you give someone $5,000 for donating eggs, I don't think that somebody will do it for the money because it's not enough money to go through that process. And this was something that a lot of egg donors reiterated. All of them unanimously in the study felt that they should be paid and felt that there should be payment in Canada. That being said, a lot of them felt that payment enough was not adequate in order to convince them to donate their eggs. They did, however, speak of payment as something that that helped with the gratitude aspect of egg donation, and also that helped to kind of equate the pros and cons of egg donation. 
So the second was helping gratitude and knowing the outcome of the donation. So Brooke, who previously I quoted, who was nervous about the intended parents getting pregnant at all, says, I got paid for it, but I have none of that money and I have a potential child out there. So is it really worth it? I helped someone achieve the goal of being a parent. Absolutely, it was worth it. Tiffany says, I like to know they were successful and have their kids and have their family. They got what they wanted. So just to kind of review some of the main, the main pieces that come out of this. So egg donors really, in this case, were economic actors. They are thoughtfully thinking about the pros and the cons, and they were weighing them in terms of what they felt was the best choice for them. Um, so the notable losses were, of course, the unexpected commitment of egg donation, the unknown aspect of the physical risks, and the emotional risks, and that symbolism of the genetic link. Um, in terms of the notable gains, again, money helps to equate the transaction, but compensation alone was not enough to convince someone to donate. And the ability to help, um, this seemed like a small endeavor in comparison to the possible outcomes. So this ability to help comes with symbolic returns. So for instance, that feeling good or gratitude was a very significant aspect. So just to sum up, um, many of the donors had donated um, years before. And so I think with a little retrospection, sometimes we always have a better feeling of, of how um, we enjoyed a process or what our overall perception was of a process. So for those donors who had donated some time before, in thinking about was it worth it, um, many of them said that it was worth it. Um, there was a common theme of people saying that there were no regrets. Perhaps it wasn't something they would want to do again, but no regrets. Although surprisingly, most of the donors were willing to donate again. And this was surprising given the fact that some of the donors who had had um, major side effects and who had really not enjoyed the experience still were willing to do it. And this has been a finding of other people who have conducted research on egg donors and is constantly found to be surprising because if you think about this from like a rational calculus perspective, you would think that people who weigh the pros and cons would not ultimately decide to do this again. But I think it indicates the very large role that feelings play in making these kinds of decisions. And certainly the egg donors who I spoke with found that um, the overall gain, for instance, of intended parents perhaps being able to have a child outweighed all of the what they perceived to be the cons of the donation. And I think the second part was that um, a lot of them felt that in going forward on a second donation, they would be able to take more control of the donation and make changes, for instance, with the clinic that they worked with, with knowing to ask for a bit more money or having a greater understanding of what was involved. So that's all that I have to say, um, and I will pass it on now to Angel. Down a bit. There we go. Is that good? All right. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Um, so I just uh, want to thank Vardit for setting this up and having me here, and thank you for the introductions. Um, and I wanted to add a couple things. So Vardit mentioned um, that one of the things I do is I'm involved with the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society, um, and they're a professional organization for um, fertility clinic um, clinicians, so doctors and nurses and staff across Canada. Um, and they, one of the things they do as a society is put together these guidelines that are um, like standards of care or best practice to assist the clinicians. Um, so hopefully that people read them and follow them. Uh, so we are, Vardit and I will be working on one um, on advanced parental age and assisted reproduction. Um, I also wanted to mention two more that might be of interest. So one that was completed last year um, is on third party reproduction. So that uh, takes into consideration um, some of the work that Katie's been doing around egg donors. So they're part of that guideline. And there's also one that we're working on right now on social egg freezing. Um, so that's in the works as well. So egg freezing is what I'm going to be talking about. And um, I'm going to sort of build on the um, explanation that Katie gave about the process of egg donation, because they sort of are uh, similar in some respects, um, because egg freezing uh, is a way to sort of self-donate, right, when you're doing it for um, social reasons or medical reasons. I'm going to explain the differences between the two. And um, the goal, really, for this talk is to um, 
get us thinking about sort of three things. Um, so in the background, I'd like us thinking about sort of where fertility uh, fits into um, our health and our well-being, right? So how important is fertility? And in thinking about how important fertility is for both um, uh, men and women, for all persons, how important is it to preserve somebody's fertility, right? To preserve the option of being able to have genetically related children in the future. Um, the second piece is around this notion of reproductive choice, and this sort of alludes to what Vardit said at the beginning around um, this sort of relatively recent phenomenon where things that we understand as a social problem because of the way society is structured because of certain constraints um, end up really uh, putting pressure on individual women, right? So that it feels like it's their problem, it feels like they have to find a solution to it, and in some ways assisted reproductive technologies in general, egg freezing in particular, is sort of framed as the answer to that problem. And sort of thinking about, you know, is that picture problematic in itself? And um, I'm going to put those two on the table, and hopefully we can get back to them in discussion. And what I'm going to do now is uh, lay out sort of the ethical, legal, and social considerations around egg freezing. Okay. All right. So um, to start, I'm going to sort of uh, explain sort of where egg freezing diverts from uh, egg donation. So as Katie explained, um, to retrieve eggs, to extract eggs, uh, the person um, doing the sort of egg freezing in this case, will have to take hormones, okay, uh, for usually for a few weeks. Um, the eggs are extracted surgically, and then with egg freezing, um, they get frozen and stored, okay? So that's sort of that piece, like stage one of fertility preservation, right? Stage two happens if and when um, in the future that person decides to come back to use their stored reproductive material, to use their eggs, okay? And if they want to use them, um, what they have to do is have those eggs thawed and then they get matured, or sorry, fertilized in a petri dish, okay? And um, then the resulting um, embryo or zygote gets implanted. So they have to go through IVF in the st second stage if they want to use their material, okay? And I point this out because um, it's important to think about that some people might only just do the first stage and they never do the second stage, okay? And if they decide to use them in the future, then there's sort of, there's this sort of all these medical considerations and additional risks and additional costs around it, okay? Now, there are, generally speaking, two kinds of reasons that somebody might want to freeze their eggs. Um, and it could be to guard against disease-related infertility, okay? And often you'll hear this called medical egg freezing, okay? Examples of this are people that have cancer. So if someone gets diagnosed with cancer and the fertility is at risk, um, they can opt to freeze their eggs. And they do the same process. Um, they have to take, hormonal, uh, take hormones, have the eggs extracted and frozen. Um, there are other medical uh, conditions that also put people's fertility at risk, so they might choose to freeze their eggs in that case. Um, there are intersex conditions. There are people who are transgender and um, undergoing part of their gender-affirming surgery, and part of that surgery puts their reproductive um, uh, materials at risk, so puts their ovaries at risk, for example, and they might choose egg freezing. Okay, so that's on the one side. And the other side is what typically gets referred to as social egg freezing. Okay, and um, we're going to be calling it today egg freezing to guard against age-related infertility. Okay? Um, and this can include sort of anybody else that might want to do it. Okay? In the news, we hear a lot about sort of the young professional woman. So we think about Apple and Facebook, where they've made egg freezing as part of their benefits package. So that might be the kind of person who chooses to freeze their eggs. Um, it might be students, uh, somebody going to grad school, law school, um, having this really long academic career ahead of them and not seeing family as being a possibility in the near future. Um, it's single people, right, who don't have a partner yet and they aren't ready or prepared or don't want to go on this journey of parenthood alone. Um, and there are also cases of thinking of uh, jobs that might put your fertility at risk, okay? like people who are in the military, for example. And um, the U.S. military just started offering, I think recently, to freeze women's eggs as part of sort of um, part of their service. That was an option to them before deployment. Okay, so we've got sort of this range of people. Um, now, to give you an idea of sort of who's doing the egg freezing, um, the most recent stats I've seen, I think, were from 2013. Um, 2014, and about, I think, 66% of egg freezing cycles were for these social reasons, okay, so to guard against age-related infertility. Um, about 18% were for cancer, okay, and the other, I'm going to do the math, I have 33 here, um, was for other diseases, 
Okay. So just to give you an idea, and that stat is a little bit dated, I think, now. And if I had to guess, my guess would be that the um, social egg freezing um, has sort of skyrocketed from, from what I've heard from some clinics, particularly in the U.S., where they do some really aggressive marketing. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to focus just on this social egg freezing or age, uh, egg freezing to guard against age-related infertility. So one study that looked at the reasons for why uh, uh, women who choose to freeze their eggs do so um, found this. I don't know if you guys can see that okay. So the biggest reason um, is 88%. It's a lack of a partner. Okay, so the kind of rhetoric we hear in the media is, you know, these career-driven women that don't want to settle down and don't want to have kids, right, and they're trying to have it all. You know, it turns out most of the women that are choosing to do this are doing so because they don't have someone to have um, children with, okay? Um, there are sort of professional reasons um, and academic reasons that would, choose, you know, people that are still in school um, or pursuing a career. And then there are financial reasons. Having kids is really expensive. Um, the cost of living is going up. And I know sort of a lot of people in their 20s and 30s that can't imagine having to be responsible for another human being when they can barely afford, you know, their own lives. Okay. And then um, there's sort of this too big of a commitment, so people that just aren't quite ready yet, um, I guess emotionally or personally, and then sort of other, this other category. Okay. This is important because the majority of people that are choosing to freeze their eggs are saying that they're doing so because they don't have a partner yet. There was, oh, so this is borrowed from a paper, so it's, uh, yeah, you oh, more than, there's more than one reason, okay. right? So somebody could say, I don't have a partner, and it's really expensive, yeah. So the lack of partner could theoretically be everybody's, like, second main reason, although it appears here that it's, like, the predominant, it could actually be, people could have mentioned three reasons, and it's, like, the number three, almost always. Um, so I don't know, I don't know that they ordered them um, in this particular study, um, but from what I've heard sort of anecdotally talking to people, it really is for most people the biggest reason, right? Because when you do have, I think, when you do have a steady partner, it, you know, hopefully doubles your income, doubles your, you know, capability to actually parent a person. It's like take some of the burden off. You've got, you've got a partner, you've got somebody there to sort of help out. Um, you know, even if you were in school or working on a career, if you had somebody, especially somebody who's willing to stay home and take care of the kid and raise them, then I think that would sort of sway the balance. But um, I guess that's a point for further research because it might be that, you know, the balances might tip differently if we ask some different questions. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you sort of a brief summary of some of the risks that we wanted to take uh, into consideration. There's medical risks, and then I pulled up the financial aspect here too, um, because I think one of the things you want to think about in the background is that this is, you know, part of a business, right? This is expensive, um, and I don't think the cost is insignificant for most people. Um, so the risks associated with egg freezing, um, sort of in the first stage, we have uh, the risk that Katie mentioned around the hormone therapy, okay? Um, in particular is this risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Um, in Canada, from what we hear, is that this rate is very low, it's very unlikely, but um, it's worth pointing out that in a lot of cases, people aren't really tracking, they're not really, um, especially in healthy women who are undergoing hormone therapy, um, there isn't the kind of um, reporting that would make this sort of information readily available, right? So we've got some work to do there, I think, um, sort of as healthcare professionals in the fertility industry and sort of as a society to be demanding that information. Um, worth pointing out as well, um, there's this time factor that's really important for people who are doing this for disease-related reasons, right? So in thinking about maybe what the similarities and differences are between the two um, motivations, the different motivations for pursuing egg freezing, um, if someone is doing this in the cancer context, for example, they're on um, a very short schedule, right? They have to do this before their therapy starts, okay? So that just makes the decision making around this a little bit more stressful, a little bit more difficult. It might apply to women too that are sort of in their mid to late 30s, or may, yeah, mid to late 30s where they might ha not have as much time as well, okay? So time is gonna play a factor as well. Um, in the future, uh, there are gonna be risks related to IVF, okay? Um, and there are gonna be medical risks related to having a child at an older age if you decide to have a child at an older age. Because okay. you could do it at 20 and for whatever reason decide to use your eggs at 28, but the older you get, the riskier it is um, uh, for the woman, for the gestating person, and for the child. Okay. Now the costs, um, the estimates I've seen, and it's 
um, varies clinic to clinic, province to province. Um, it's sort of five to ten thousand dollars to do the stimulated cycles to retrieve the eggs, okay? and that includes sort of the consultation, the medications, the lab fees the retrieval, sometimes the storage, but in addition, usually there's the extra storage fee that's anywhere from three to $500 a year, okay? Um, and then if you decide to use IVF in the future, um, it could easily be another $10,000 and up, okay? And the way it works is sort of in some places, every time you go in to have an, uh, an egg or I guess an embryo implanted, right, you have to pay. So if it works the first time, not so bad. If you have to go in 10 times to try and get pregnant, then your cost increases. Okay, so what are the ethical, legal, and social considerations? I'm going to list them off, explain some of them a little bit, but sort of put them on the table so when we get to discussion, hopefully we can come back to some of these. Okay, so one thing we're thinking about is the differences and similarities between the um, egg freezing for disease-related reasons and egg freezing for age-related reasons. Okay? Some people think that there is a moral difference there. Okay? Um, that you have more choice in one circumstance than the other. What I want to suggest that is maybe because the way our society is structured, you know, we don't have that much choice on either side in some respects, right? Our options are very limited in both uh, instances. Okay. Um, so there's considerations about reproductive choice and autonomy that Vardit mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so how important is that? Um, and also how much of it do we have to in egg freezing, right? Um, there are going to be risks to benefits, uh, so that I mentioned the earlier slide with respect to sort of the cost, res with respect to the medical risks. Okay, both for the person, the individual woman, and any resulting offspring. Um, there are serious challenges around uh, obtaining informed consent, okay, or promoting informed choice in this context, because a lot of cases people are going in and our data is limited, right? So just like in the case of egg donation, right, it's not always entirely clear what you're signing up for. Okay, so there's some risk there. Um, there is the costs and the financial burdens. So egg freezing is expensive, um, and it's not available to a lot of people, right? So this technology gets framed as sort of this option for like, you know, freeing women and leveling the playing field between women and men and, you know, as if anybody can use it, but it's expensive, right? So um, in some ways what it does is it's, it's giving an extra option to people that are already privileged, right? Because they had the money and the means to do this, right? So it might just be making sort of the gap between the people that have and the people that don't have a little bit bigger. Um, there is, uh, in the background, this sort of commercialization aspect that I hinted to earlier. So um, I don't know if you've seen uh, there are egg freezing parties happening in the U.S. If you haven't seen them yet, check them out. Um, people actually freeze their eggs at the party. No. <laughs> what they do, I know. If, if they could do that, I bet they would. If they had a room in the back. Um, what they do is uh, fertility clinics or agencies invite women, a particular kind of woman. So the, like they go to New York and invite people that are, you know, uh, professionals and trendy and, you know, in this sort of certain age range and they invite them in and um, in some cases they're partners and they give them alcohol and food and they say, let me tell you all about egg freezing. Um, and they do. As, and you get a discount in some of them. So if you sign up and you sign up a friend, you know, they give you a deal. Um, so it's just they're adding this incentive to freeze your eggs and they're making it very attractive and they're doing this while you're drinking. So um, I find it interesting, okay, to say the least. All right. They, adver um, they advertise on dating sites. I don't know if they do. That, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if you went on a dating site and an ad for egg freezing popped up, um, especially if you Google it. Like, all these things are connected, right? It's like the internet's watching you, and they'll, they'll figure it out. You put in your age, and then egg freezing comes up. Um, OK, so the other things are sort of the pressures to freeze. Um, so I don't know. I feel like if my company would be paying me or allow, paying for me to do something, you know, that's some incentive. It's some serious incentive. I like free things, right? Even if I don't need it, I'm like, well, I could do this. So there might be a little bit of pressure there. There might be employers that are saying, you should do this. You know, we need you. I don't have kids yet. Um, there's pressure from family and friends and peers. Um, I know I would guess that most of the women in this room, at least, have been asked, do you have kids? When are you having kids? What are you waiting for? And that's a pretty common, you know, question to get asked as a woman. Okay. Um, there is the value of genetically related children. Right? So we're saying this is the only way to have a kid, but actually, you know, you could use an egg donor. Um, you could adopt, right? So if you want to raise a kid, it's really the social parenting, right, that you're going to end up with. But how important is that genetic link? Something to think about. Um, there are going to be uh, sort of legal issues around the disposition, right? So if a lot of people freeze eggs and never go back for them, what do we do with them, right? What should we do with them? 
Um, there are storage limits, like how long should we keep the eggs indefinitely? Um, I don't know. Uh, the UK tried to impose a limit, and then they added all these exceptions, and it's now sort of been contested. Right? Um, and then when you do allow people for, to delay or to store eggs for a long period of time, then you might get people coming back when they're 40, 45, 50, 55. I don't know, right? The oldest woman, women um, to uh, undergo IVF were in their 70s in India, right? So one of the things we need to think about is sort of what kind of um, or how advanced um, frontal age this uh, promotes, right? So how far is this going to push the reproductive envelope? Sorry, the ones you're talking about in India, they're not the intended social mothers, right? They were yep. grandmothers or at least one or two? Nope, they were, they were raising the children, yeah. But they didn't use their own yeah. eggs. Yeah. They used donor eggs. But, they yeah. had their own children. So, if, but if I froze my eggs now and waited like 35 years, and like you know, that could be me, right? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, technology will be really good then, right? So I won't have to worry. I'll be you know a very healthy 70 or 75 year old. We'll live forever. Exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, so a couple other things: so there's delayed parenthood. We need to think about. Um, and there's this in the background. There's this trend of you know having kids later, and that changes things. It changes the gaps between generations, right? That increases public health care costs if there are increased risks. So we have some sort of population considerations we need to think about, and then there's public health considerations as well. Um, and then finally, there's the point that uh, Ardeep mentioned at the beginning, you know, so we've got this medicalization, right, for a social problem. We're taking something that's social and sort of, you know, dumping it onto the individual. Okay. So thank you. Um, I'm also going to leave this slide up um, just to sort of highlight um, Impact Ethics blog, uh, which I manage at Dalhousie, I know. We've got lots on there about egg freezing okay, and assisted reproduction if you're interested. So if you check out the blog, um, there are some really great short articles um, on these topics and you can follow up on. The final assignment of the Reproductive Ethics Seminar who's in the class is to write a piece for you. That's great. That's awesome. uh, we also love submissions. So. <laughs> Uh, Lori, I just want to point out that we published a paper uh, that we titled Sleepwalking into Infertility, uh, and the title comes from a quote from a woman in a media article that said precisely this, I was unaware, I was uninformed, and one day I woke up and found myself. Uh, so I just want to support what you said from a very personal perspective with research data that shows that very educated women know very little about fertility and fertility decline, what ages this happens, what are the chances of success with uh, spontaneous conception and IVF in the various, in various age groups, women are not informed, even those who are very well informed in other areas of their lives. So this is, again, we talked about a systemic societal issue. Uh, we don't talk about it in high school, we don't talk about it uh, family physicians don't talk about it with their young female patients. There are so many points at which we could tackle this issue and we don't. So we need to do some serious soul searching as a society and that's exactly what this forum is about. Okay. Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lori. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi everybody. It's nice meeting everybody here. So yes, I uh, produced the film with uh, Aaron. Um, it's called In Vitro, Our New Fertility Frontier. So and basically we set off on this journey of, of understanding sort of what was happening in terms of fertility, especially amongst the friends that, uh, that I have. Um, quite a few of them were undergoing IVF or considering IVF. It just, it seems to be sort of occurring in within the age group that I'm in. And at the same time, there was uh, Gaetan Barrette uh, who was deciding to change IVF policy. And uh, in late 2014, all of a sudden, they completely decided to remove the, the freely funded IVF in Quebec. So it was extremely difficult for some of my friends who were sort of partway through the process. And then all of a sudden, they realized, maybe I'm just not going to have uh, babies. Maybe because this whole policy has changed. It changed. Um, everything's going to change for me. So it caused a great deal of stress and strife um, amongst a lot of the people um, that I knew that were going through this. Um, so as we explored the issue, one of <laughs> and we were, were starting to set about finding people to be in the documentary, 
and finding uh, participants, um, it was incredibly difficult. Not a lot of people wanted to talk about this publicly. Um, it was, um, as Erin knows, like she helped <laughs> research this. Um, we had so many people who we started having conversations with who were like, we want to hear your stories, we want to hear what's happening with you, and they would just drop like flies. People were extremely embarrassed to talk about this. They felt like it was a personal failing that they couldn't have a baby. It was incredibly intimate um, to them, and I was kind of surprised. I thought, oh, you know, people would want to sort of discuss this issue. People would be interested in, you know, letting uh, people know what they were going through, sharing their stories, but no, it was very, there was definitely a wall that occurred as we were trying to find subjects to participate. And oftentimes we would start uh, f like even researching or filming somebody and then uh, halfway through they'd be like, you know what, I just don't want to talk about this subject with uh, the greater community. I'm, this is like, it's just too much for me and my husband and, and whatever else. So I, it, it just struck me what an incredibly t uh, taboo subject this still is at this point. I kind of thought that maybe we had gotten over it to a certain extent, but in fact, uh, infertility is just, people just felt like it was their, um, their fault that they were infertile or that they had somehow committed a crime against society or it was just, it was a bit over the top. I was very surprised that people's uh, reaction that they, they weren't able to give birth. It seemed like a very big deal to a lot of people. Um, and then also as we got into the documentary, one of the really interesting questions that uh, I wanted to discuss was uh, social versus medical infertility. It seemed like there was a lot more support for medical infertility and hardly a, a lot less support for social infertility. So I felt like a lot of the blame was being put on women, you know, like if, you have med if you're have if you medically infertile, well then, you know, you have medical problems. So um, there seemed to always be a reason uh, for that. But in terms of social infertility, a lot of the, place, the blame was placed on the women themselves. They felt very, um, like it was their responsibility because they had waited too long, they weren't sure about what they were doing, they, they felt like they had, they had messed up because they had waited to be uh, 39 before they uh, really started focusing on the fact that they wanted to have um, children. Um, in terms of the, <clears throat> the media messages, um, I think in terms of like the role that uh, media plays in informing everybody, uh, one of the things that I came across too is that e even for myself and I think for Aaron, um, we, we were walking through this very uninformed, even though we, I think when you're younger you feel very immortal, you feel like you have all the time in the world, you think, oh, whatever, you just like, for, fertility really does not play a huge part when you're in your early 30s. You really set it aside. You don't seem to care very much. There's just so many other things that are so uh, much more important at that period of your life. It, I certainly didn't think about it at all. I thought, oh, it's going to happen when you know I'm 35 or 36 or 37. You just keep on pushing it further and further until you hit a point where you're like, oh, like if I don't figure this out in the next <laughs> six months, this is going to be an issue. Um, and I feel that you know it's. There's strange things happening because we have all this freedom now, so we really have to figure out what our priorities are, and nobody's really discussing this. Nobody's really sort of talking about uh, how important this is and how you really should not wait for such a long time because technology is sort of not at the point where it can just sort of give us everything we want. We kind of think it can, but um, the reality is that it can't. Um, I mean, we can push reproductive, our reproductive abilities up to the point of like, maybe, you know, mid 40s, <laughs> maybe with IVF, but it's, um, it's pretty risky. Um, I think the media sort of plays into the narrative of sort of developing this reproductive utopia where you can pretty much, I mean, it depends sort of what side of the media you're looking at. Um, in terms of ads, in terms of Hollywood, in terms of mainstream messaging, there's, a, uh, there's really a developed notion of this reproductive utopia. You can really sort of have what you want when you want, want it and you don't have to really think about it until you get to the point where you're actually really thinking about it. And that, 
that sort of plays into the whole idea of us of sleepwalking um, until we get to the point where um, uh, where it's almost almost too late. So um, media does play uh, a bit of a harmful role in ter terms of that. But I would say that uh, media also can play a very important role in terms of sending out the message that, you know, do take a look at this, know what the facts are, don't sleepwalk your way into infertility, as, as you were saying. Um, so media really does have like a two-pronged sort of part to play in, in uh, this whole um, narrative. Um, and um, you know, when I was making this this film um, with Aaron, I just what struck me was um, sort of like, you know, the fact that the subject is really at uh, crossroads of um, it's at the cr crossroads of basically uh, society, dreams and our, our dreams and hopes, our fears. So it's such a very uh, intimate, very scary thing for people. And, uh, and it, I think we should sort of discuss it more. And with this documentary with Aaron, that's sort of, we were trying to bring up all of these topics. So that's Thank it. You. Thank you. So, uh, Lori, thank you. I want to highlight two elements out of what you said. One is the stigmatization of infertility and of IVF that we think we're so advanced as a society, but the people undergoing this still feel very isolated and very stigmatized, and that, I think, really explains the difficulty in finding people who are willing to expose their stories. And the second thing is this pressure to become a parent. Uh, again, we think of ourselves as a very progressive society, but we're still all asked, do you have kids? When do you plan to have them? Oh, no, why not? <laughs> so this is so embedded in our society that there comes a point in an adult's life or you just expect it to become a parent, and is it really a choice, especially for women? So these are two elements that kind of emerged from all of us, but uh, I want to highlight them. Not having children is still very stigmatized. Infertility is very difficult to cope with in our society, and having children is often not even perceived as a real choice. 